Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on inflammation and angiogenesis. In this video, what we're going to talk about is chemokines. Okay, we're going to look at their structure, and we're going to look at the four different types of chemokines and how they're different. Okay, so chemokines. So, firstly, let's start off with what chemokine actually means. Where is the origin of uh, the name chemokine? Well, basically, it is short for chemoattractive, or also chemotactic. Um, so, I'll use chemotactic. Chemotactic cytokines, okay? And uh, a cytokine is a molecule, a signaling molecule between two cells. Chemotactic means that it's going to attract uh, cells towards it, basically. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the structure of these uh, proteins, and then let's see examples of uh, different chemokines and see where they're important in uh, the immune system. Okay, so we'll start with the structure of chemokines. So chemokines are proteins that are usually between 8 and 10 kilodaltons in size. Now, what does that mean? Well, kilodaltons is abbreviated to KDA, and in full, this is kilodalton, like so. Now, what is a dalton? Okay, well, a dalton, one dalton is uh, the mass of a proton or a neutron. Okay, so when people talk about mass number of an atom, they mean the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So basically, a Dalton is the mass of a single proton. So if you're between 8 and 10 kilodaltons, it means that the mass of this structure is 8,000 to 10,000 protons, basically. The same mass as 8 to 10,000 protons. Okay, so that's what a Dalton is. One Dalton is uh, the mass of a proton, basically. Okay, so it's a way of measuring the weight of things, or the, sorry, the weight is different from mass. It's the way of measuring the mass of things, where we measure the mass relative uh, to uh, the mass of a proton, basically. Okay, so that tells you roughly how big this sort of thing is. So they're not that big for proteins. There are proteins that are much, much bigger than this. Okay, so let's now have a look at the structure of a chemokine, because this is how you decide whether a molecule is a chemokine or not. Okay, so one characteristic is that they are chemoattractant, basically. However, really the deciding factor for whether you're going to call a cytokine a chemokine is to do with its structure. Okay, so let me show you the structure of a chemokine, and I'm going to draw this nice and big. Okay, so here is the amino group of the protein. So this is the amino terminus of the polypeptide. Then this line represents the polypeptide. It represents the polymer of amino acids all connected together. Now it folds round like this, and then loops down like this, and then has these three beta strands here. One, two, three and then finally finishes with an alpha helix that comes out in front of these beta strands here. Okay, and there's the carboxylic acid terminus here. Okay, so let me highlight up some specific portions of this structure. So, this portion here, which is at the front basically, this piece I've outlined, well highlighted in green, this is an alpha helix. Okay, so this is right at the front, it's in front of these three beta strands as they are, so I'll highlight those. Okay, so these three beta strands, those are all in the, the same plane together, they're uh, all connected together to make a small beta pleated sheet here. Okay, so in orange, these are beta strands and they're all in the same plane. Okay, then in the plane in front of them, you have this alpha helix going in front, and then you also have this linker here. This is in front of uh, the beta strands here. So these are beta strands. Okay, now, uh, what holds this structure together? Well, there's 
two important disulfide bonds, basically. So in most chemokines, you have four cysteine amino acids. So let me show you the structure of a cysteine amino acid. Okay, and I'll draw it as though it's in a peptide. So I'll draw the residue rather than the pure amino acid. So here's the amino group here, and then it will be connected to the carboxylic acid group above. And then you'd have an alpha carbon here, with a hydrogen coming off it, and then the carboxylic acid group down here, which would then be connected by an amide bond to the next amino acid along. Okay, now what's the R group for cysteine? Because this is just the core amino acid structure so far. Okay, well you have a methylene group, and then you have a thiol group, which is basically like an alcohol group, except that instead of an oxygen attached to a hydrogen, you have a sulfur atom attached to a hydrogen. Now, sulfur is in the same uh, group of the periodic table as oxygen, so it has very similar properties to oxygen. Okay, so this is the structure of a cysteine residue. And I realise that I've actually written this already, but never mind. Um, and the single letter amino acid code for cysteine is a C. So I will abbreviate it as a C. So you have a C here, which is known as the first cysteine of the chemokine molecule. Then you have a second cysteine, which is very close by this one. And we're going to discuss four different families of uh, chemokines. Now, most of them have these four cysteines that I'm about to um, talk about. One family doesn't have uh, four cysteines, it only has two, and we'll discuss that one separately. Okay, they also, uh, the other three families which do have four cysteines, they differ in the number of uh, amino acids that are between these two cysteines, the first and the second cysteine, which are close to the amino terminus. Okay, then you follow the structure around, it loops back here, goes into this beta strand here, and then you have another cysteine up here. Okay, you have another beta strand down here, another beta strand, and then up here you have another cysteine amino acid. So this is the third cysteine in the chemokine, and this is the fourth cysteine in the chemokine. Now we'll see that nearly all chemokines have this structure. The family that only has two cysteines, there's only two known members in that. So most chemokines do have these four cysteine uh, residues. Okay, now what's the significance of these four cysteine residues? Well, basically, they can form disulfide bonds between one another. So let me show this by uh, drawing two cysteines that are reasonably close together. So, Imagine that we're taking this cysteine, this first cysteine here, and this third cysteine here, and let's have a look at what they're going to do with each other. Okay, so here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off, so I'm just copying this structure out up here. Here's the carboxylic acid group that's linked to another amino group. And then here is our methylene group. Okay, and then we would have our file group, but I'm going to be fortuitous and not draw the hydrogen because it's actually going to be involved in a disulfide bond with this other cysteine that's at position 3. So this is the position 1 cysteine. Okay, now let's draw this uh, position 3 cysteine. Now, uh, what direction will the amino group be in? So the amino group's going to be closer, so it'll be over here kind of thing, right? So I'll put this up here as well. Okay, so here's the amino group again. Here's the alpha carbon, here's the hydrogen, here's the carboxylic acid group, and then let's put the R group here, okay, and then again you'll have a file group, but the two file groups have given up their hydrogens, and instead they've brought, uh, built a bond between the two known as a disulfide bond. So this bond here is very important. This is what's known as a disulfide bond. Bond, also known as a disulfide bridge, and you're going to get these formed between the first cysteine and the third cysteine, and also the second cysteine and the fourth cysteine, and these uh, bonds are what hold uh, the chemokine structure together. Okay, so before we start discussing the individual families and examples uh, of chemokines within the individual families, let's just discuss uh, the main function of chemokines. So the main function, now this is not true of all chemokines, okay, but the main, the general principle is this, that in 
uh, the inflammatory response, okay? So if you have a tissue which is infected, then you want to recruit uh, leukocytes or white blood cells out of the bloodstream, okay? You want to move them from the blood into the interstitial fluid so that they can go and fight the pathogen. Okay, now chemokines are involved in this recruitment of leukocytes. So if we have an endothelial cell here, okay, so this represents an endothelial cell that uh, is at the site of uh, inflammation, basically then this endothelial cell can put chemokines on its apical surface here, the side which faces the blood, and these chemokines will interact with uh, receptors on the surface of the leukocytes, and that will cause the adhesion of the leukocyte to the apical membrane of the endothelial cell, which will then lead to uh, the recruitment of that uh, leukocyte into the interstitial fluid where it's needed to fight whatever pathogen has caused the inflammatory response. Okay, so where do we put these chemokines? Because these don't look as though they're a transmembrane protein. They're not a transmembrane protein. They're not an integral membrane protein. So they're not going to sit in the membrane. Instead, they're going to be attached to something that's on the surface of the endothelial cell. So, on the surface of all endothelial cells in your body, you have polysaccharides attached to the surface. So, over the top of the membrane of the phospholipid bilayer, you will then have polysaccharides all over the place. Okay, now this layer of polysaccharides that's on the surface of the endothelial cell is what's known as the glycocalyx. Okay, now one of the key polysaccharides that's within the glycocalyx is a polysaccharide known as heparan sulfate, and it's often called heparan sulfate proteoglycan. And the reason it's called heparan sulfate proteoglycan is that glycan is another name for polysaccharide. Okay, it specifically generally implies that it's a polysaccharide of glucose. Okay, and proteoglycan means that uh, the polysaccharide is attached to proteins. So basically, if we have the phospholipid bilayer here, so this is the phospholipid bilayer, you'll then have a bunch of integral membrane proteins which will span the membrane and sort of sit in it. And then you'll have this polysaccharides. They will be attached to the integral membrane proteins, and that's how they're held on the surface. So that's why they're called proteoglycans, because they're attached to proteins and they're polysaccharides. And then what you're going to do is attach the chemokines onto these polysaccharides. So the chemokines are not attached in the membrane. Instead, they're attached to this um, glycocalyx, and one of the specific uh, carbohydrates that they're attached to is heparan sulfate. So here is our chemokine, now just demoted to being represented as a blue box here, okay? And it's attached basically to that heparan sulfate uh, proteoglycan. Okay, so this is our chemokine. Okay, so uh, we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll discuss the four separate families of chemokines.